so, so maybe this whole profession of oops, of a philosopher of science of, is is a bit of a fraud because they seem to be so far removed from their presumed subject. Yeah. But how does that relate to? I mean, let's talk about some well-known, well, fa let's say famous philosophers of science that that uh, people talk about, and, and uh, how about uh, Popper and the Popperians, who arguably played, Popper I would say, played a big role in making philosophy of science uh, more broadly interesting and popular among social scientists, and you know, there was a debate, uh, and to, I mean, eventually the outcome of the debate was that there was no more interest, generally, in philosophy of science. But what about uh, Popper and the Popperians and then and, and Kuhn and Feyerabend and, and the ones well, that uh, have, yeah. I think Popper has uh, two great uh, virtues. One is that he writes or he wrote clearly. Uh, with a minimum of uh, technical uh, terms, and he wanted to be understood because he saw clearly. And the second is that he was a, a very good defender of realism, uh, but he had no common, he had no ethics, and so he was his position concerning the philosophers was very weak. For instance, he was very admit the existence of part of the reality of the truth of part psychology uh, and uh, he <clears throat> was very angry with me when I wrote a paper criticizing the steady state theory in cosmology uh, which posited among other things that matter is being created all the time ex nihilo from nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a scientific theory because it is reputable. Yeah. Many ideas are reputable, but you don't get in the workplace for refuting, for instance, the hypothesis uh, of the existence of big food. You, you need mm, positive evidence in addition to that. For instance, if someone claims that uh, AIDS is caused by a certain virus, well, you have to show that the virus exists, and moreover, you have to show the effect it has on animals. And uh, you need positive proof, you need positive evidence, not only a negative evidence. If Le Verrier comes with the idea that, or <coughs> others, that there is a, a planet, a new planet called Uranus, well, somehow, somehow I have to find it. It's not enough to refuse the proposition, proposition that there are no plants in that region. You have to, to exhibit an image of the planet and so also forth. So his negativism is uh, exaggerated. And, uh, but it's, it's also, yes, it's also uh, uh, quite uh, unhelpful, or to say, say it's stronger useless, for a practicing scientist, oh. uh, which yeah. I actually experienced personally in trying to yeah. use the philosophy as, as my guiding yeah. philosophy. And yet, Popper is the only philosopher of science that, that philosopher that found this with nowadays, is younger. They also used to read, it in not quote, cool, but everyone has realized by now that the whole cool uh, uh, thesis is, is, is a flaw. And uh, even also in the case of Fire and his close friends and follower, uh, <coughs> the idea that there are no standards, that anything goes, and um, things like that. <coughs> so, uh, but. Uh, you, do you think those were, that Kuhn and Fire um, were in a way. Uh, <coughs> I don't want to say logical, but logical in quotation marks, outgrowths of Popper's philosophy? No, I don't think that uh, Feyerabend certainly knew Popper's uh, philosophy. He was Popper's assistant for, for, for a while, but he didn't have the uh, patience 
for the intelligence to, <clears throat> to study the things necessary to refute uh, proper effectively also he became a postmodernist, a total uh, <clears throat> his rationalist. Mm -hmm. He said there is nothing to prevent the scientists from believing that there are ghosts and demons, demons, and, demons and so on and so forth. And he talked about the tyranny of science. And uh, he was, he had an artistic temperament, as you know. Once he, he called me <clears throat> the form from Florida's saying he was very proud because he had just been offered the deanship of the School of Art, uh, <laughs> Music of Syria, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he was for a while, he was in East Berlin trying to, uh, trying to learn Bertha Bert Brecht's uh, theater techniques. And uh, he was a dilettante, he was not a serious scholar, mm -hmm. he was a dilettante. Mm -hmm. um, like, like many others, the most philosophers are in the time period. <clears throat> they may disavow, they never uh, sit a few years, try to work things out. Uh, there's no time they have to publish, they have to, uh, they have to produce papers in order to get promotions and so on and so forth. Um, but in any case, uh, I think Fanny Abbott has been forgotten for a not, not so cool. I could is still being quoted and you still have to, to argue with people. <clears throat> but then finally, as you know, Kuhn owes his celebrity to things that he has never done. For instance, during the student revolution in Germany, uh, students took his uh, book on scientific revolutions to be a revolutionary manifesto. They didn't know <laughs> that Kuhn was very conservative, that Kuhn was horrified by revolutions, and at least political revolutions. And of course they didn't know that <coughs> there had been only two real scientific revolutions in history. First, the birth of science in ancient Greece, and second, the scientific revolution of the 17th century. All well, others are breakthroughs, but not the revolution, because they came out partial alterations, not uh, complete uh, <coughs> changes, complete changes in, in the world. You know. But in any case, um, no, I think Cole was uh, a sincere guy, but totally confused, utterly confused. There is this famous interview of uh, <coughs> the journalist uh, who went to my team and he asked him, uh, Cool. Um, so you you believe that every time there is a scientific revolution, the world changes. The world says, of course it changes. And uh, do you really believe the second question? Do you believe that the world exists outside your your brain? Yes, of course it does. <laughs> it's some <not> incompatibility to the two things. He was very superficial, and uh, his analysis and Fire's analysis. Um, the theory of relativity was totally wrong. It took just one for formula out of context, and it was it was it was wrong. A wrong analysis. They didn't have a deep understanding mm -hmm. of science, but. Uh, I think now they were troubles me concerning the philosophy of science nowadays is the resistance uh, to learning new things. Let me give you another personal anecdote. So, three or four years ago, I wrote a paper on inverse problems. Inverse problems are all the rage among physicists and among engineers nowadays. Uh, nine years ago, no, ten years ago, the first international congress of inverse problems uh, met in Hong Kong. And so, I wrote a paper and sent it around to the main journals of computer science. Projected, they never heard about <coughs> inverse problems. If they never heard, they cannot exist. And yet, we, are, we, we meet them every day. For instance, I try to guess what you are thinking about from your gestures. Um, the <coughs> medical doctor. Uh, who gave your 
the center, the center is something that he cannot see, so he has to conjecture, he has to solve the problem of what is, what are the causes, the possible causes, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I worked in, when I first started uh, doing physics, nuclear physics, uh, the problems I, I faced were inverse problems. Trying to find out what happens uh, is uh, in the collision between, let's say, the protons uh, just from the way they are scattered from one another. Uh, that's a typical uh, inverse problem. The engineer who is asked to produce a device that will design a device that will produce such and such an effect. He's given this effect, he has to invent the cause. Every inference or every conjecture from effects to causes is uh, a solution to an inverse problem. So they are the most difficult ones. Sometimes they have no solutions, but other times they have many more than one solution. So they are the most interesting, and so they should, they should appeal to the philosophers because of the difficulty. No, they don't exist. And one of the referees said, oh yes, Lakatos is in such a such place that that we was well, No, what <laughs> Lakatos did was to deal with a totally different problem, namely uh, the truth by reduction to absurdity. So it has not, nothing to do. <laughs> but given what you say about uh, philosophers of science, isn't it a good thing that they have very little influence, that very few scientists, social scientists, care at all about yeah. philosophy of science? Yeah. And as a consequence of that remoteness, philosophers usually contribute very little, if anything, to the development of science. For instance, uh, Philosophers have almost uh, <clears throat> unanimously they rejected the old Hippocratic idea that uh, mental events are brain events. Uh, most of them adopted dualism, like uh, Descartes and mm -hmm. even Popper, of course. And as a consequence, they were aware that the philosophers had been obstacles to the transformation of psychology into cognitive neuroscience. Uh, fortunately, uh, medical psychology paid no attention to philosophers. Oh, but uh, eventually, cognitive neuroscience was born about 80 years ago uh, as, a, as a going concern, and nowadays it is the most prolific. Uh, to, to but you know who who uh, is almost without exception um, opposed to the idea that uh, neuropsychology may have implications for social life. Oh, yeah. All sociologists, <laughs> sociologists will will not uh, no, accept. They, no. they say, okay, you can do that, but yeah. it does not affect what we do. Well, this is changing. This is changing. It has been changing for the past 70 years. Then Among they, sociologists? They, they, yeah. They, it's now recognized that there is such thing as social cognitive neuroscience. This is changing. Uh, it is recognized as a branch of, of neuroscience. Yes, but it does not contain any sociologists. Oh, no, no. It hasn't reached the sociology. Sociology has, has still uh, to learn about that. But um, <clears throat> no, they ref but, but they refuse as well. Yeah. They, yeah. And, and well, well, but uh, they are beginning, you know. And uh, for instance, it is now well known that uh, oppression uh, causes has psychological effects that people. To such an extent that people get sick. Uh, there is a famous uh, <clears throat> study, the so called Whitehall study, uh, has two parts to it. Whitehall study one and Whitehall study two. A study of the uh, health and the mortality 
of the uh, civil servants in England. They are millions, thousands of them are concentrated in the big building in London called Whitehall. And so they show that although all the civil servants have access to the same uh, shell services, they all have permanent jobs so that they are not anxious about their <coughs> the stability of their jobs. And they all earn quite well. The fact is that those on top live several years more than those below. And those in the, in the lower ranks of the hierarchy um, have the highest uh, the highest rate of, of sickness. And uh, so, in other words, the lack of freedom or oppression makes you sick, makes you physically sick. Mm -hmm. And so, the, the, the mechanism is, is, is quite well known, but namely that stress, social stress in this particular case, uh, the inability to, to disobey orders, to escape the net, the deliverance of the produces stress in society which increases the rate of production of cortisol. And cortisol goes to the whole organism and uh, it really kills cells. So it, it, it sickens people. And uh, so here you have a number of levels and a number of aspects, uh, social, biological, psychological, etc. Uh, and so this is an argument for freedom and moral work for self-management rather than for the hierarchical, the hierarchical organizations. If you manage your own affairs or they have an intervention, you, you can <coughs> contribute to the organization of your own work, you feel less constrained, less oppressed, and so you get less sick. So the, the idea is that workers in the cooperative get less sick than workers in the, in the usual uh, business firm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still an open question, though, whether uh, all forms of subordination uh, are bad for the organism of the person that is on the lower rung. There may be some that, uh, I mean, in light of the fact that uh, a high level of individualism and with it often social isolation um, creates a lot of stress yeah. as well. Um, and so I, I guess a more fine-grained kind of understanding is necessary uh, because the, the, the very isolated but not formally subordinated yeah. person may, may be much well, uh, more st uh, stressed uh, than... Uh, uh, precisely. Uh, you have the voluntary organizations, the NGOs, you really don't have a hierarchical uh, organization. Everyone takes the part of the, in the design of the policies and the discussion of the day-to-day -day work and so on and so forth. Uh, they are all equal. <coughs> there are no bosses. And no one owns anything. Uh, they are collective enterprises, and people are happy working there. NGOs, not all NGOs. Mm -hmm. You mean cooperatives, or yeah, cooperatives, cooperatives of all, all kinds. Mm -hmm. Cooperatives that are enterprises for, for profit, for, for profit enterprises, like the famous Mondragon, Mondragon in in the Basque Country, or. Well, non-profit organizations such as the Salvation Army, our uh, clubs and uh, student unions and so on and so forth. Of course, there are there are always conflicts over power and things like that. But they can be resolved peacefully and, and never in an authoritarian way. So you have to earn mm -hmm. your the, the rank is there is an advantage, you have to earn it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the idea, we started asking, what can philosophers contribute? Well, philosophers are quite a bit, very little, find something in physics. 
they have cut it with it practically nothing to the conundrums of quantum physics. Quantum physics has faced philosophical problems for nearly one century. It was born in 1825 and from the start, from the start, the fathers of quantum physics, Warren Heisenberg, adopted a positive, a new positive dogma. They need a series helps to represent only appearances, uh, measurement results in Cape Town. And uh, as uh, Heisenberg said in his autobiography, the an atom is a, a concept that occurs in the description of an observation or a measurement. There are no atoms out there. Yeah. And um, philosophers have, uh, in this particular case, there have been too subservient. They have believed whatever nonsense a scientist said instead of criticizing it from the start. Of course, Marxist philosophers did protest that on the completely wrong because they misunderstood. They thought that these theories, relativity and quantum theory, were very subjectivistic in thought. But what subjectivistic was a particular interpretation to me given by certain physicists to their own theories. And so the Marxist philosophers also contributed to <coughs> the lack of understanding to obscure this debate. And, or for instance, uh, 30 years ago, there were these famous experiments on entanglement uh, by uh, Alain Aspect and, and others. And so philosophers said, oh, realism has been refuted. They had adopted the faulty definition that, that Einstein had given of realism, of real think or element of reality and of realism. For Einstein But uh, in the teaching of philosophy, mm -hmm. I think that there is a definite reverse. For instance, 40 or 50 years ago, the phenomenology and the existentialism were totally unknown in North America. And nowadays, existentialism and phenomenology courses are required courses of McGill University. And it's still not there because they don't understand it. There's nothing to be understood. But they know the professor don't tell them that. It's not the happy new universe. I remember the first time I mentioned Heidegger nearly half a century ago at the University of Pennsylvania. Exactly half a century ago. The students have never heard about Heidegger or existentialism, no one. But the, the, the people, philosophers, were more interested in, uh, interested in more interesting uh, subject. And nowadays you cannot become a philosopher in professor of peace in North America, uh, just like in, in Europe, in France, just by talking nonsense. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, uh, but modernism has and lower the standards, the score is standards, tremendously. It, it, there have been no regrets. And um, is that so? Is that true that you. Uh, people who are not regressive mm -hmm. in philosophy, and who are for charity and so on and so forth, they think that uh, it is enough for the philosophical arguments to be formally correct. Never mind the content. The analytical yeah, philosophers. And so, yeah. interesting problems are not dealt with. Mm -hmm. uh, they're too, too hard. Mm -hmm. the, is it true that you spent once a long, is it true that you once spent quite a long time studying Hegel? Yes. I didn't spend time. I wasted time. <laughs> I wasted some of my best years. <clears throat> between the ages of 17 and 22 or 23, something like that. Uh, at the same time, I was, I was studying physics, I was also trying to understand Hegel, and what is worse, I thought I understood him. Mm. Which is, of course, uh, a clear mark that 
I didn't understand that. Most of what he said was nonsense. Now, what he had over the other charlatans, he was a charlatan in my view, but he had one great advantage that this explains partly his popularity, namely that he dealt with interesting problems, and important problems, mm. unlike the other charlatans. Uh, <clears throat> the Schopenhauer, as you know, understood that he was a charlatan and said so, but he was no less of a charlatan than Schopenhauer than he, and moreover, uh, he didn't say anything interesting, anything worth discussing. Uh, his ideas were completely crazy, just like the of Schelling. Uh, but uh, Hegel uh, did touch on a number of very important problems, and uh, the state of freedom, and even participation, you know. You know once in a while he had some uh, bright ideas, uh, uh, but not too often. And here, uh, one of his main, uh, the, the, the main, the, uh, uh, let's say, um, negative points about him is that he inspired the Marxists. He, Marxists adopted from Marx on his work. And he said, what is it? They, they said, that, you know, it's just a question of, uh, of, of changing uh, his ontology. Uh, whatever he talks about ideas, just uh, put uh, matter and uh, material, and that will that will uh, fix the thing. Well, it's, it's, it's not true. They believe in all these hermetic propositions of cases concerning contradiction and so on, and, and this has prevented, largely prevented, the development of. Uh, uh, the Marxist uh, philosophy, Marxist philosophy has remained stagnant for uh, a century and a half. But to think that, uh, <clears throat> you know, in Germany, before the, before the reunification, there were two Hegel societies, one in East Germany and the other in West Germany. And they fought each other, but both of them regarded Hegel as the, 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 the mighty thinker, as Marx called him. And none of them uh, tolerated uh, any, any discussion of Hegel's status. Mm -hmm. So Do yes, think... I spent, uh, I wasted a lot of time, and what, what saved me uh, was the study, my encounter with mathematics and logic. Uh, well, we didn't start logic and physics, of course. <coughs> uh, <coughs> it was about time, all of a sudden, in the year 52, uh, the two volumes of uh, George Boone's Laws of Thought uh, fell into my hands, just by chance. And <coughs> in, a, in a few days, I realized that they hold the entire hanging I was shot of it, and I became an enthusiast of my medical logic. Uh, Boone was a very interesting guy. He was uh, mainly self-taught, and he wrote not only he was not only one of the builders of uh, modern mathematical logic. He also wrote a fantastic book on the probability calculus in, in 1850 or so, uh, which uh, people nowadays, if people were to read that book, they would claim much of the philosophy of probability. They were, for instance, one of the, uh, some of the contemporary cosmologists talk about the probability uh, that there be life in, the, in one of the many universes that they imagine. And uh, so they, they, they compute the probability, and one of them, famous guy, Tegmark, uh, says that the probability calculus allows you to compute the probability that there be life in a given universe. He doesn't know what the book says in the beginning, one of his, in his book of probability, that the probability calculus cannot <coughs> evaluate the primary probability. What he does is to compute the probability of compound events from 
a problem, they assume from a component or constituent of this. For instance, probability of A or B, alpha probability of A and probability of B. So in any case, mm -hmm. it's only to Hegel Can I ask you one thing about, did, did, did Marx uh, get the, uh, his understanding of the uh, centrality of social relations uh, out of Hegel somehow? That, that in well, uh, I don't know about social relations, but we know uh, this, that uh, Marx took from Hegel the idea that uh, society precedes the individual. Mm -hmm. They coexist, of course. There is no society without individuals, and there is no individual that is not part of some society. It's like a part and whole relation. It's uh, uh, Hegel follows, that he follows Aysen, who says that the, the whole precedes the part. But it's a complete nonsense. But the notion of either makes no sense without the notion of the other. And what, for instance, Mark was a, a, a holist to the extent that he says that uh, society uh, creates the ideas that are transmitted to the individual, but the ideas come from society to the individual, not the other way around. <coughs> Uh, that is a very unfortunate trait of one of the many unfortunate traits of, of Marxism. That is, it is holist. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, uh, I just learned that Max Weber uh, shared my enthusiasm for um, Frederick Engels' the first study, the study of the situation of the working classes in England. Uh, that he did, it was an empirical study, sociological study, that he, before he met Marx, he went to Manchester and went to the homes of a number of workers in the uh, mills of Manchester and inquired about the way they lived and so on. And it was an empirical study, moreover, it was quantitative. Uh, unfortunately, that was the first and last sociological study that Engels did. So there is no Marxist sociologists, you know. Uh, so they, they completely, they, they were not interested in that. They were, they were only, there was only Marxist uh, economics and, and Marxist history, but not Marxist sociology or Marxist politics. Mm -hmm. this, this is one of the reasons that they were totally unable to understand when they came to power, to understand the, the societies that they ruled. Well, that has changed at least a little bit as far as Marxists, although few people call themselves Marxists that are strongly influenced by him. Who? Few people call themselves Marxists or neo-Marxists, even though I would say that, oh, yeah. that you know, they have a, oh, But they have that changed Marx, all of these particular... Marx, they were plagiarists, plagiarists, Marx. On many occasions, oh, yeah. uh, and, uh, but others uh, admit the importance of, of Marx. Uh, unfortunately, Marxists don't admit anything that doesn't come from the Marxist mills. Uh, so uh, they haven't learned anything. Mm -hmm. It's true that there are many new Marxists, but they are, in, in my view, quite incompetent, with the exception of the historians. The, the French historians have no longer correlates with Marxists, but the uh, school of the Annals uh, unfortunately disintegrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some of the uh, British historians, like uh, Eric Thompson and uh, Eric uh, Hobsbawm, mm -hmm. but they live with him very little of Marxism. For one thing, they, don't, they never refer to the other things. Uh, they reject the Marxist ontology, which comes from Hegel. Mm. So yeah. I went, I was the first of my university, McGill, to give a course on Marxist philosophy some 30 years ago. I had something like 80 students, 
Most of them from political science have never been exposed. One could not talk about Marxism. 30 but years ago, in, the, in 1980, or this was in 1980? Yeah, something like that, yes. The, the, in the student? So, well, when I came here yeah. uh, to, to Canada, I needed to consult Marxist Capital. It was not in the uh, city, it was only in the agricultural college, which is very far away from downtown, so I never got to it. So, uh, only uh, 10 or 20 years later, with the student revolution and so on, you know, there were too many Marxist books which no one read, no one analyzed, no one read. But in any case, that course of Marxist philosophy, I limited myself to a few authors, authors that I knew, namely Marx, Engels, and Lenin. And every time I said something, I tell criticism, there was a student who knew about some new Marxists. They said, Yeah, yeah, they may have said that by so and so, and to say, for instance, mm -hmm. or <laughs> well, we'll say something different, but in the end, I said, I'm not, never going to repeat that this course because obviously my students know much, much more about contemporary Marxism than I do. And anyway, I don't care for this, uh, unless innovation, because none of these new Marxists have produced anything. Mm -hmm. They just uh, have uh, transformed, made some changes in Marxism, but none of them have produced a work an analysis of the, the political system of France or the economic system of Western Germany or Russia. And no, they have been totally scholastic. Just comments upon comments upon comments. Mm -hmm. Marxist scholastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very complex relationship, and uh, one that is not really well understood. As you just said, <coughs> our philosophy and uh, science separated only recently, just a uh, few centuries ago. Formerly, there was no, no distinction, and even at the time of Newton, physics was called natural philosophy. There was no more philosophy and natural philosophy. Uh, unfortunately, the separation came, I uh, think, at the time of Kant. It was a question <coughs> very related to the organization of universities. But in any case, in my view, uh, science has a philosophical kernel, a nucleus. It's not, uh, philosophy and science are not disjoint. Uh, they, are, they overlap partially. And that philosophical nucleus of science is composed of at least three main phases, or perhaps four or five. One is an ontological thesis <coughs> uh, that the universe is material, there are no spirits floating around. The second is the realist idea, epistemological thesis, realism, meaning that. <coughs> The, the world can be known, and the scientific, uh, the scientific enterprise consists in trying to know, to reconstruct in conceptual terms that reality external and internal too. And then there is a moral component, very important one, underlined by, for the first time by Robert Merton in 1947, uh, the, uh, like humanist uh, uh, thesis, that science ought to be <coughs> pro human and uh, first of all, secular, of course, if I'm secular, but secular should be in the service of mankind, but there should be no mercenary science in the service, let's say, of war or regressive politics and so on and so forth. And so, these are three thesis, I think, when any one of them it fails and is forgotten, then science derails. For instance, I just got this uh, book uh, by Davis and, and others. Uh, Davis is a physicist turned theologian, and she held the Templeton Prize some time ago, precisely for 
uh, declaring that science uh, is not against religion, that they do combine. And what is a bridge? Oh, the bridge, according to the book, the bridge between science and theology is information. Either information theory or the mere concept of information. And so here we will read the Marcoset contributors to the book that says that <clears throat> the concept of information uh, in semantic information can be extended from the human realm to the cosmos and uh, so it is seen, he says, so he says, the notion of semantic information is extensive to cover the idea of the cosmic unembodied consciousness, unembodied consciousness. The consciousness can happen outside the brain, which carries and transmits the informational code for the construction of this and any possible universe. That is the mind of God. So, it's the true one. So, it's, uh, now we have finally the proof that uh, uh, God exists, and of course, God is a big computer, or perhaps not even that, but it's a computer program. Uh, so, uh, this is very, very fast now, and it is linked also to another modern uh, myth, namely the myth of the parallel universes. So, uh, not only philosophers, but also a number of cosmologists and astrophysicists uh, and string theorists uh, have proclaimed that there are many universes, possibly infinitely many universes, which are totally disconnected among each other, so they cannot be, <coughs> there can, there can be no information trans transmission, no signals going from one uh, world to the other. How do they know if <coughs> our universe is not connected to the Earth? How do they know that it is? Oh, never mind. It's not a question of giving two. It's totally dogmatic. And the string theory, for instance, they even calculated the exact number of uh, extra universes. There are 10 raised to 500 animalismal number of extra universes, parallel universes. Some of them have laws totally different from ours, others have the similar laws. And in that case, those that have similar laws, they contain human beings like us to do exactly the things that you and I are doing right now. Well, of course, who knows? I don't mind. How, how do we know that? It's a matter of faith. In this case, it's secular faith, but it's very similar to religious faith in the sense that both are dogmatic. They need no good. It could, could be an overprice. prize. If you cannot get in the way, at least a temperature price. <laughs> uh, uh, right, but so, in that case, what was faith in that case was faith in that case, of course, is of course the material cities that enter the real cities. The material cities that the universe is material and the real cities that it can be known. So here we see people who are distinguished from us not only philosophers, who claim that most of reality is a law in principle. It's not, not only that some, that most characters are very distant from us, so there's no way we're starting in contact. No, it's simply that we belong to different universes that are disconnected from ours. Usually there's, there's some purpose behind strange uh, uh, inventions of, of ontic Things. Yeah. What is the what is the reason behind theirs? What, what are they trying to gain by? I say this is a good question. What does one gain by that? Mm -hmm. Do they solve any problem? No. They pose a problem. The only problem they pose is as my <coughs> my daughter, the psychologist, and, uh, and they, the problem that they pose is how they explain that rational beings or scientists and some of them. A well seasoned scientist, a serious scientist, come to believe in all that nonsense. How is it possible that they are so good in their specialties and when it comes to 
On this, they say Athari. Another very popular fantasy is... Do, will you have an answer or, or a, 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 a hypothesis about why this is the case? Why people who are great in their special areas are yeah. so pedestrian in... Well, it's, it's of course not a new, a new phenomenon. Leibniz was a great mathematician, but his physics was rotten, and his ontology even more so, because he was the inventor of the monads that are uh, isolated from one another, disconnected, and so on. But he was a great tradition, he was a, uh, <clears throat> uh, a great mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, co-inventor with Newton of the intelligent calculus and so on. And in addition, he was, he was really a humanist who, in the midst of those horrible wars, he was trying to find peace and things like that. He was a good guy, mm. yeah. unlike most philosophers. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, there. A number of cases, it's very interesting, a number of very distinguished scientists, modern scientists, who believe all kinds of top nonsense. For instance, Charles Vichy, Nobel Prize for discovering allergy, the anaphylactic uh, shock, uh, at the beginning of the last century. He believed in parapsychology, not only did he believe, he was the president of the French Association of Parapsychology, then there was a famous uh, René Blondeau, a Caesar physicist who distinguished himself in, in physics, and he believed that he had discovered the end race, a completely different kind of race. And uh, the Americans sent a very prestigious physicist, specialist in optic wood, to check whether this was true or not, and he did check without noticing, without Blondor noticing, he, he took out the prism that <coughs> Blondor had used in his paper to show uh, that <coughs> the um, end rays refracted the same ways as uh, same way as light waves, and he claimed that still the phenomenon of current, although the apparatus was out of out of the orbit. And he believed in the existence of his end rays till the end of his life. Then there was, of course, Holday, one of the creators of the synthetic theory of evolution, and one uh, distinguished analysis and so on, who believed in Lysenko, in Trofim Lysenko, the charlatan prophecy of Stalin, a veneralization process. And only the other day, Luc Montagnier, the discoverer of the HIV, Virus, he proclaimed his faith in homeopathy. And as you know, the homeopathy dilutions are so extreme that what you get is uh, something like one molecule per galaxy. The density is so low that the chance of uh, such a molecule hitting your organism is practically a uh, And So there are a number of of very distinguished scientists who fall for this or that nonsense. Another very fashionable nonsense is the it's from bits. It, Matilda thinks, we are very distinguished American to claim that it's just a bunch of bits of information units, zeros and ones. And once I ask him, uh, tell me how many uh, bits are there in a hamburger. So he started to calculate, and after two or three minutes, he came up with a huge. <laughs> what's, the, what's the evidence for it? There's no evidence, or there can be no evidence, because bits have no energy, and energy is the characteristic of material things. The perception characteristic is a property, the universal property. All things, whether they are particles or radiation, they all have energy. And so, how is it possible for an, an immaterial thing, a moral a symbol, like a zero or a one, to have physical properties? Well, 
similar to the Christian uh, myth of the transubstantiation, when, when a priest uh, drinks uh, wine, he is drinking the blood of Christ, and not symbolically, but actually, when he eats uh, a little bit here, the, the pizza of bread or whatever, he eats Christ's body and so on. He believes that, all right, that's all right for a priest, for a priest. For, but for a scientist to believe that you can transmute a symbol into a material thing, it's, it's very hard. Uh, but it's novel, it's, uh, it's, not, it sounds very original, which it is, of course, but, uh, and it will shock many people, and so you get publicity for that. But maybe, maybe that is a bit, uh, these things have some similarity with the placebo effect. The placebo? Oh, yeah, yeah. Placebo yeah. effect? In that, um, there's, uh, there's no direct physical connection. Yet, yet, the mechanisms are different that produce the result, but they're not unrelated. Yeah. They, they actually may be just a symbol as long as the yeah. cognizing brain yeah, exactly. sees yeah. that symbol as yeah. meaning something which in turn mobilizes yeah. other physical yeah. processes. Yeah, but you know, the, the original conception of the placebo effect was <clears throat> uh, an idealist one. And it was just a matter of belief. No, no. It really happens, this is now being investigated, the relation between <clears throat> the cortex and the subcortical systems, how the subcortical systems in particular, the ones that control the, immu the immune system, uh, are connected, so that a signal coming from the cortex, cognition, let's say, to um, the immune system is really a physical symbol. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you get the bad news, uh, you are more predisposed to um, become ill, or is it, if you are optimistic, you are more likely to recover from sickness and so on and so forth. It used to be believed that to be just uh, all, all women's uh, stories, but therefore we are. But um, in any case, the thing is that science or scientific investigation rather, uh, has a philosophical nucleus, and uh, if one of the elements of that nucleus is missing, then uh, scientific research may delay, maybe can lead to scientific, as in the cases of the, of the <coughs> it from this um, myth, and the case of the parallel universes, and in the people who sincerely believe in, in homeopathy, and parapsychology, and psychoanalysis, and all that nonsense. So, this uh, mistake, uh, to believe that uh, a solid scientific experience immunizes you, it can shut it, so it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be interesting for scientists to get courses in methodology or in history of science, at least. But the trouble again is that so few philosophers are really conversant with the science. Uh, most of them don't know science. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I found just uh, recently <coughs> studying the problem of indicators. Uh, for instance, <coughs> uh, an atomic physicist that doesn't have direct access to atomic processes, he needs intermediates between the microphysical world and the macrophysical soul. <coughs> he needs, for instance, a bubble chamber, a wisdom chamber. Uh, and what he sees in the wisdom chamber are uh, little drops, droplets that have been formed or have been ionized by the process of a, an electrically charged particle such as an electron or a proton and so on. <clears throat> so he doesn't see the protons, he doesn't see the electrons, but he can see the droplets, he can see on the tracks left by the passage of that, that uh, electron or proton or cosmic drink and so on. And so, or you don't know that there is an electric current going through this, uh, <clears throat> this apparatus just by touching it, you get an electric shock. But you have 
measurements that we have across the pieces of, of equipment that measure the, <coughs> for instance, the magnetic field associated with electric currents and so on. This is how you, you can measure the intensity of the electric current and so on and so forth. But if you look at the right things in philosophical science, but most philosophers, you won't find even the word, uh, not, not even the concept of English. Hopefully, the university press. And the philosophy, uh, the director of the philosophy series, answered me very quickly by giving me a piece of advice. He know that it was impossible. Uh, I should write in the following way. I should take, well, take subjects like matter of mind. I should concentrate on a very restricted subject and then engage with other philosophers, contemporary philosophers, that are written about the series. I should engage in this scholastic uh, game. No? In that case, he might consider the publishing something of mine. But uh, he's very well known. Uh, I can tell you the name. Peter Momchilov. Hmm. So, this is typical of uh, the, uh, the arrogance, the ignorance, and of uh, 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 these people, this censor there, yeah, he's a real censor. Of uh, these censors, mm. who of course he never produced anything, he will never produce, moreover, he feels entitled to prevent other people from producing interesting stuff uh, because he has the, <clears throat> he has a vision of, of a blind man, he doesn't know what philosophy is, he doesn't know that philosophers have the uh, habit of putting this this part of the things together, of relating things that at first sight are unrelated. Uh, he doesn't know what it is. Oh, but, uh, they but, have but he is a gate. tremendous power. He's a gatekeeper, yeah. Yeah, the gatekeeper, exactly, the gatekeeper. To prevent uh, new ideas. You know more than that, but everything is quick, very quick, so there is no time to reflect, to give a second thought, or have second thoughts on something. No, it's uh, like all technological, all technological innovation have something positive and something negative. Mm -hmm. uh, then, I mean, one thing that uh, I found was very, was very useful in, in what you presented was uh, the relationship of social science and social technology and the significance of the intervening factor of ideology, which, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's like a very powerful filter that will only turn insights into technology that, that suit a preconceived conception, even if that conception is is completely undermined by science yeah. and by the insights of... There's a very interesting example, which is not very well known. That was the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund in Washington has two basic departments. One is a research department, and the other is a policy department. The research department is very good, very high level, a number of people who successfully got the work prize, in working there, they get good data, <coughs> and uh, they got they build interesting uh, research on trends, for instance, the effects of the so-called liberalization uh, on on the emerging economies and so on. But then the policy department, which is ideological, there's no attention whatsoever to the findings of the research department. For instance, the research department finds that liberalization has been a disaster, has ruined most of the industrial industries in the Latin America. But then the policy department insists on the neoliberal 
a point of view, which is, <coughs> as you know, was proclaimed from high up by Reagan and by Clinton and by the two Bushes and so on, that um, free, free trade is the solution to all the possible uh, social ills. And uh, regardless of what the research department <coughs> So in the reasonable, in a well-organized society, my uh, ideology is, and science uh, should come together. The ideology should use, make use of the findings of society, of, of the scientists. And the scientists should look at the sociology of uh, ideology to see what are the uh, problems of interest people <laughs> and what are the present political currents that are in favor or block. But in a way, in a, in a strange way, that's what is happening. Many economists look at the ideo ideologues and the politicians <laughs> and say, well, what do, they, what do they want? And then they supply basically uh, justifications, rationalizations with the veneer of science for what they want to do for ideological reasons. So that's a coming together as well, but it's more of the kind that science and ideology came together in Marxism and Leninism, you know, where the science was <laughs> subordinate to the party's higher purposes. What's well, so interesting, the first Reagan presidency, uh, Reagan did not cut the budget of basic science, but made huge cuts in the social sciences because the conservatives are not interested in that people get to know what's happening in their societies uh, because that might be, might be, <coughs> uh, fighting might be very dangerous. For instance, it is well known that over the past 30 or 40 years, the Gini index that measures the income inequality had been rising from point the three to point forty-five in the states and in Canada also. Likewise. And this increase in inequality goes against the myth of American equality, the, the myth concocted by no less than Alexis de Fabri, because she emphasized the equality in America. He didn't he didn't see this Who was that? Alexis de Tocqueville. Oh, Tocqueville. Yeah, all, as the English said, Tocqueville. Uh -huh. uh, 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 and uh, so he didn't see slaves, he didn't see also the white, uh, white uh, peasants, landless peasants, uh, who, of course, not being owners, but not in fact, involved. He didn't see the inequality. In, in all respects, but he, he, he saw, he contrasted the equality that he saw in the middle class in the uh, upper classes with the, uh, with the French aristocracy and so on. But in any case, uh, to come back, uh, the fact is that uh, America that was famous for its social mobility is now famous for the lack of mobility, because of the mobility, for the fact that the <coughs> social inequalities, instead of diminishing, are increasing. And uh, the fact also that the economy has changed completely over the past 20 to 30 years. Now the finance sector is the most important. It, it covers something like two thirds of the economy. And America has ceased to produce useful things. Only recently, uh, uh, President Obama remarked on that. that. He wants to go back to the time when the Americans produced things that they would export worldwide. Well, this is so far wishful thinking. <coughs> because the fact is that he himself is probably wearing a Chinese made clothes and so on. <laughs> uh, but in any case, 
l'American society has changed enormously over uh, since the last war. Mm -hmm. And uh, very few people seem to have noticed that the entrepreneur, the, tip, the classical entrepreneur, or the loaded by, by, by Schumpeter, has been replaced by the banker, uh, by the manager of the hedge fund, or things like that. These are the people who count now, these are the wealthiest people now. Not uh, the people, not the entrepreneurs who took risks and who got together with inventors who were really innovators in industry. Those people are of no interest whatsoever. But, <clears throat> and there's also a decline in education until recently the United States was a country with the highest rate of <clears throat> college students in the world, now it's number nine. There are more college students, more people going to college in, in other countries than in the States. It used to be number one, and now it's not number nine. And so that will be seen in all of the sectors of society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and the top, uh, much of the top talent, both in universities, but also in, in the private sector are imported from other countries yeah. and not produced yeah. locally. Yeah. I mean, they are produced maybe at the PhD stage of graduate students. Yeah. Almost half the graduate students at the big places like MIT are from outside America. Yeah. So, also, 40% uh, uh, of GDP is financial industry. Oh, <laughs> oh. ridiculous. Two percent would be too much already. <laughs> yeah. And the same thing is happening in, in the third world, with the exception of India and China. Or over in some you know, the quality of science in China and in India is very it's very unequal. In some Sectors are doing very well in others. They are not doing well. In particular, in philosophy, China is not producing any new and new original thoughts. Very powerful. Yeah, but that's even true for here, as yeah. you said earlier. Yeah. And they're, but they're investing a lot in 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 science yeah. and in, in, in universities in China. Yeah. But the way, apparently, it was very different from the market in China, and it could pay them thoroughly. They are discovering a uh, process in hell. Uh, they are, uh, but uh, in neuroscience or in other branches and in the humanities, they are not, not doing that well. And this is particular, particular due to the power of the Marxist and Leninist ideology, they still, <coughs> Marxism is still the official ideology in the universities. Although <coughs> the country has long ceased to be socialized in many sense of the world, but still, the philosophy they learn has to be orthodox of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Oh, it's very economistic, so it's, mm -hmm. it's very economistic. Yeah. So it's useful right. for capitalism too. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, let's call it a, enough for today. Okay. Um, so we talk about, or you talk about, uh, democracy, economic and political, yeah. since you've been working a lot, well, the book before your last book on Mind and Matter was on political philosophy, and in your preceding books on social science and sociology, you've also talked about your conception of democracy and of a democratic economy. So, it would be nice if you could lay out a few of your uh, planks of the your conception. 
and perhaps how it differs from so from others. Okay, well, there have been a debate, as you know, over the past two and a half centuries concerning democracy and its reach. And uh, everyone agrees that democracy has been expanding ever since the French Revolution, uh, but it's only in political democracy that has been expanding uh, within countries and uh, across the world. The question is this. Political democracy assumes that we are all equal. But in fact, we are not equal because we have different economic powers and cultural powers. And so it happens that even in the earliest democratic regime, in France and in the United States, political democracy is accompanied with a great disparity in economic uh, power. So that ultimately the people who have with more economic power can also buy uh, political power. Uh, corruption is widespread. It's not limited to Italy. It occurs everywhere. Whenever political parties representing the interests of the money, the properties, the classes can buy far more uh, TD hours than the leftist political parties. Oh, but uh, things are more complicated than that because the extreme left, the Marxists didn't uh, never care very much for political democracy, particularly since the famous criticism of Marx of the Gotha program of the German Democratic, the Social Democratic Party in the 1880s, something like that. Uh, so, uh, Marxists usually called political democracy formal democracy, and they couldn't care less for that. I think that's a very bad, a very serious mistake, because if you enjoy political democracy, then you can fight for economic democracy and cultural democracy. And, uh, and also biological democracy, equality of race, and so on. So, my, um, my proposal is this, that it's not a question of forgetting about political democracy, but of enlarging it to encompass not only economic, but also cultural and biological and democracy. But it's <coughs> basic equality or at least equality of opportunities for people of all uh, of all ethnic groups and uh, all occupations. Uh, but uh, more than that, uh, traditional socialists or rather uh, Marxists have rejected the idea that workers can manage by themselves you know, workplaces, uh, and uh, in other words, they have rejected cooperatives as being a distraction in the, the march, in the inevitable march towards the uh, common society. Uh, moreover, and of course, on the right wing, they say, well, cooperatives are not viable, they cannot compete with the big enterprises. But there are very interesting and all exceptions. For instance, there are thousands of very frowning cooperatives in Italy that are more than a hundred years old and that have been able to compete with the private sector. Why? Because the private sector doesn't find it profitable, profitable to do certain kinds of work. Uh, a good example is the desiccation of the uh, swamps 
around uh, Rome. Uh, <coughs> no private firm would do that. And so a number of unemployed workers in the Asiatic uh, went to Rome and formed a cooperative and they started working uh, at that in the 1880s. But 30 years later, or 40 years later, Mussolini continued to work and he attributed the fascist regime all the, the virtue of having keen investigated those those wrongs. But actually, the people who started them and who worked there, there for several decades were our members of the cooperative that was established precisely uh, to do that kind of work and they did it very successfully even though they didn't have uh, <coughs> full support of, of the Italian state. To in any case, but there is a, a, a number of cooperatives in Switzerland, for instance, the two main supermarket chains uh, are cooperatives. They are doing very well. They are spread throughout the country, but they are uh, distribution or uh, trade cooperatives. They are not work cooperatives. Now, there are work cooperatives in the States, for instance, uh, wood of a certain, certain kind uh, is uh, worked by the in these cooperatives, and uh, but to me the most sh most shining example of of a cooperative is the Mondragon conglomerate in the Basque Country. It has a very really interesting uh, history. It was organized by a Jesuit priest, Jose Maria Arismendiaveta, uh, 53 years ago during the Franco regime. And he allied himself with four engineers and they set up a number of factories. But there are now more than a hundred different firms, uh, cooperative firms, that form this sort of conglomerate, very successful. They constitute the ninth firm in, in Spain. They produce not only for the internal market, but also for export. And uh, they cover practically all the sectors of the economy. And they had only one thing, one bankruptcy in more than half a century. Whereas on the other hand, as you know, there is a yearbook of bankruptcy in the United States that shows that on the average, Firms last only in, in, the, in the West, they <coughs> last only about five years on the average. This, this firm, this corporate firm, has lasted for ten times as much, for more than half a century. And uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that if a firm, if an ordinary firm is a, a difficult problem, the workers couldn't get less, so they don't. <coughs> Chain, they don't cooperate to solve the problem. In the case of a cooperative, since it is their own, they make sacrifices. And also, the various cooperatives, the flourishing cooperatives, the wealthy cooperatives, help the poor ones. In any case, uh, to me, the cooperative is the only solution, uh, the, the only kind of, of economic democracy that works. Uh, it's completely different from the state-managed firms in the former Soviet Union that were a disaster, technologically uh, backward, uh, <coughs> they were very often corrupt, they were administratively corrupt. In any case, they were quite inefficient. But <coughs> that doesn't mean that necessarily all state-owned enterprises are uh, inefficient. You can see the railways in, in Germany or in Switzerland or in France are very efficient, well managed, and not particularly corrupt. But in any case, 
Um, still, the workers have the ability to say it was a state-owned cooperation, unlike a, a, a work cooperative, which is owned and managed by other workers. This one one by one, this whole fact, I think, in that uh, it doesn't depend on banks. It has its own bank, its own financing, so that they cannot be uh, ruined by by banks, as it so often happens in the private sector. And it has its own university that trains administrators and uh, qualified workers. So, move on and the Italian cooperatives, and then of course the <coughs> German and Swiss and French cooperatives, and also the Argentine cooperatives uh, that have been quite quite successful. Uh, show that it is possible, it is practicable, it is profitable to organize uh, production and trade in the form. So in any case, the ideal society, in my view, is one that gives the maximum freedom and the same kind of responsibility. Uh, if you manage, uh, where you have participation, active participation and management of your own in the firm or schools or whatever, you are going to be responsible. Otherwise, you leave the responsibility to, to the bosses. So this you know, democratization of responsibility is technically and economically efficient. Now, participation uh, is interesting. If you maximize participation, uh, you also <coughs> have a lot of waste, waste of time. If everyone participates in the management of everyone else, it covers and a waste of time, but long discussions and long meetings um, happen. This happened, I understand, in Cuba, in the so called uh, in the local, local uh, defense or whatever organizations. Every block has its own organization and they spend hours, they spend nights and nights discussing and discussing uh, details and no one takes responsibility the responsibility so diluted that it takes uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, but then, so, in the short, I think that from a practical point of view and also from a moral point of view, uh, this expanded uh, or integral democracy is what work best. <coughs> so I call it integral uh, democracy as opposed to the partial democracies that purely political or purely racial or biological uh, democracy and so on and so forth. And how, how would the limits to participation be? Yeah, well, 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 uh, I think that <coughs> people should be free to choose to participate more or less. There are some people who, who like participating and others uh, who like to take over. And, uh, it's very rare the case where people fight over workloads. People fight over power but not over workloads. So I it happens very, very naturally, I think. Uh, uh, competence is, is value because people realize that efficiency requires technical competence. And uh, so I don't, I don't think that you can legislate that in the way that, let's say, Fourier uh, <coughs> legislated or wanted to legislate a theory the, the way that they. It's faster, faster is a uh, should work. And the the reward in, in a system like that, if, if it if it's neither primarily monetary reward nor primarily power, increased power, 
what would the reward be for someone to say take on the additional workload, take on the additional participation for the good of the whole? Well, the, the, the main reward is the pharma security. Well, the pharma security is something that the capital is really telling the guarantee. <coughs> Workers in the capital enterprise uh, expect that any any crisis there will be a uh, cause the need or uh, it will be sacked. Then in cooperatives, this is not not possible because they are owners; they don't sack themselves. Uh, so there, there, are, there is also the psychological reward that you see something that is thriving, that you have contributed to it. It's yours. <coughs> you are not working for someone else; you are working for yourself and your your colleagues. Uh, the uh, since there is, of course, there are managers and so on, but the system is not organized hierarchically in the sense that authority can be challenged, can be challenged in the assembly, and uh, if an overseer or a manager is shown to be tyrannical or incompetent, he can be removed. And uh, <coughs> so I, I, I support that the stress caused by oppression, by arbitrary <coughs> uh, authority, doesn't exist or <coughs> exist in much, uh, in a smaller way, in, in cooperatives. So that there are not only monetary rewards, uh, psychological rewards, which explains why people don't leave uh, cooperatives. Once they are accepted, um, but they stay there, they tend to stay. Mm -hmm. The award that is perhaps that uh, will be referred to as psychological is, is recognition also from peers, oh, yeah. which, uh, uh, which right. as we know is a big factor in science. Yeah. Uh, as a yeah. motivation and reward. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting thing about the cooperatives is that one doesn't have to speculate about them only in theoretical terms, whether it's an alternative form, yeah. but there are, there's a long history of cooperatives. Yeah. There are, of course, also some failures. I'm thinking of the uh, kibbutz in, in Israel, which have, I think, by and large, disappeared as cooperatives and have all been turned into capitalist enterprises. Well, the, the reason they have appeared is that they started, uh, as they were uh, flourishing, they started hiding Arabs to work, and of course, Arabs have not been welcomed on, on, the, on the same footing as, as Jews. They were discriminated against. And they, I visited several kibbutzes in, in Israel some 30 years ago, and I didn't see a, a single Jew. There were all Arabs working there. The, the Jews were in, in Tel Aviv uh, uh, managing the business. They were really the businesses that, <coughs> like any others. But uh, they said, uh, more important, uh, more important examples of failing corporatives. The uh, British corporatives. After all, the, uh, the British were the first to uh, to organize corporate firms, the famous Rochdale movement. Rochdale is a small town near Manchester. And uh, in the 18, in late 1840s or early 1850s, they organized a big corporate movement. But all the, the firms, all the, all the branches of the uh, cooperative movement were either trade cooperatives or banking. For the uh, lending for the building societies. And they, <coughs> they didn't have any work cooperatives, uh, <coughs> like in, in, in Italy or in Spain, or in, in Argentina, where they in the schools, corporate schools, private co uh, corporates. And so, the, uh, another reason for, for the failure of cooperatives. 
you look at Christ particularly, to be able to teach him for purpose, is uh, very often the uh, managers were faithful but incompetent members of the Labour Party or the Socialist Party. <coughs> they were uh, uh, entrusted, man managerial jobs were entrusted to faithful members of the party. And uh, the faithful socialist is not necessarily a competent man. Uh, so this applies particularly to the oldest Argentinian cooperative that was founded more than about a hundred and ten years ago. We used to live in Marfa in Buenos Aires in a huge apartment building, very modern, very convenient, very well built, owned by these cooperatives. El Honrado Guerrero, the workers' household. <coughs> and, uh, but uh, lately, a number of work cooperatives have been established and they are doing here quite well. Moreover, they obtained a legal victory. They were, uh, the legal status was finally. Uh, recognize a special law uh, about cooperatives. Uh, but in any case, yes, cooperatives are possible, and, uh, but provided they finance themselves and provided they don't limit themselves to trade, but they include all kinds of, of, of economic activity. Mm -hmm. They provided there is no political interference. Apparently, in Yugoslavia, the cooperatives were quite effective until uh, politicians started to, to meddle with them. Mm -hmm. Well, one sort of political interference would be useful, and that is if the, if the state set um, favorable conditions for setting up cooperatives and for yeah. running. Yeah, that may take the initiative, which is well, I was hoping that the Cuba would eventually learn to do that, but apparently they haven't done that. I think they may be trying with, with, with now with, with their agricultural. Yeah, yeah. I'm told that there are some, some attempts, but they took <coughs> something like 40 years to understand that there is an alternative mm -hmm. uh, to the year. They thought that there were only two, two, two ways to. <laughs> to, to organize the economy, either, either by the state or by the private sector. Well, they just serve one, the corporate mm -hmm. Maybe this would be a good uh, point at which to reflect on, on the actual world economic system and its power structures and its, its roaming dominance yeah. in, in really all respects financial, economic, uh, political, and cultural. Um, uh, and I guess to pose the question um, how this could, um, how one could imagine that this could be broken up in any way or that this might uh, be weakened or be replaced at least partially in the absence of any C catastrophe. Yeah. That. Yeah. How to go, in other words, how to go from the present capitalist organization to a sort of really socialist one. Not, not the communist, not the, the Marxist one, but the really socialist one. Well, uh, Spain has shown that very often, at least in, in Italy, it has often been the case, that properties have been organized from failed capitalist enterprises. Um, there was an interesting case also in Argentina some 10 or 15 years ago. Capitalist enterprises that were broke and they were taken over by their, their workers. The, uh, in, in Argentina, they, the capitalists uh, closed down the buildings and so on. And they cut them. They sold all the machinery, and so 
what the unemployed workers did was to very often they, they broke the, uh, <coughs> the locks, got into the buildings and used whatever machinery there was left and uh, they associated themselves with other uh, groups and uh, they in thriving. Uh, they, they got profit, but the, <coughs> the former owners didn't see any profit because it was not enough for them, but it was enough for the workers. Mm. Uh, so, from the ashes of capitalism, real socialism may arise. Oh, this is a possibility. Mm. It has been actualized in many examples in Italy and in Argentina. And quite unexpectedly, it was a spontaneous movement uh, in, in both cases. The people who were left all of a sudden, they were left unemployed. Well, what, what can we do? Well, let's keep doing what we did before, but instead of relying or expecting that <coughs> the boss will call us, let's do it ourselves. Let's organize ourselves. And it worked in many cases. It was very interesting because the pressure was such in Argentina that the <coughs> local legislatures in the city of Buenos Aires, in the province of Buenos Aires, had to recognize that, had to recognize the confiscation, the expropriation of the owners, uh, because the owners didn't, didn't fulfill any social role. They kept owning uh, empty factories but didn't provide them any jobs. And so the legislators uh, admitted that, just as in the case of Amsterdam, the case of the squatters. Mm -hmm. It was a case of thousands of squatters who occupied buildings for a number of years. They were not reclaimed by their owners. And so on the air, uh, <coughs> They were recognized as the legitimate owners after a number of years. But there is, <coughs> in Argentina, they say, a law, very old law is essential that a property that is not occupied for 30 years um, belongs to, uh, passes legally to the, to the occupants, mm -hmm. to the squatters. Mm -hmm.